Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for the privilege to share today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to talk with you this morning on one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Uh, and we have entitled it, The People's Prayer, or A Prayer for the People. And it's based on Luke, the 11th chapter, and Matthew, the sixth chapter. 2,000 years ago, Jesus introduced a prayer to his disciples. And that prayer has been recognized for 2,000 years as Christianity's greatest prayer. It is the greatest prayer because it can be prayed at any time. Morning, noon, and night. You can pray that prayer. It is the greatest prayer because it can be prayed at any occasion. At the birth of a baby, at a funeral service, at a wedding. It can be prayed over a crib at a graduation ceremony. I would call it an all-purpose prayer. It is the greatest prayer because it has been repeated by the greatest number of people. Think about it. For 2,000 years, people have been praying this prayer uh, from the greatest classes, kings and prime ministers and presidents and emperors and heads of states and the homeless person on the street corner praying the same prayer. It is the greatest prayer because today that prayer has been translated in more than 4,000 languages and dialects. In English and Spanish and French and Greek and Russian, people are praying this same prayer. You know, two friends were walking along one day when one uh, friend turned to the other and he said, if you are so religious, why don't you recite the Lord's Prayer? And if you can, I will give you $50. He said, man, that's going to be the, fifth, the easiest $50 I will ever earn. And so he started repeating the Lord's Prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And if I should live for other days, I pray the Lord to guide my ways. Amen. The first man looked at his friend in astonishment. Wow. I didn't think you knew the Lord's Prayer fished out a $50 bill and gave it to him. Now, for the record, that's not the Lord's Prayer. That's the classic prayer that we have all prayed, perhaps, or our parents have prayed over our cribs and our bed. Amen? This morning, I wish to lift up a few lessons from this, the Lord's Prayer. And the purpose of this, this, this presentation is to allow us to connect with each other and with God, because that is the purpose of this prayer. Now, the first point I want to make this morning, friends of God, is that this is often called the Lord's Prayer, but in reality, it should be called the people's prayer. Why should it be called the people's prayer? 
Well, 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 don't get me wrong. I understand this is a great prayer, and I understand why it is called the people's prayer. Because in all the red letter editions of the Bible, this prayer is written in red ink. Which means that these words were spoken by Jesus Christ himself. So I hear someone saying, that's why it's the Lord's Prayer, because it was spoken by Jesus. And whenever you open your Bible and you see letters in red, you ought to stop, take off your shoes from off your feet because you're about to stand on holy ground. Yes, I understand why it is called the Lord's Prayer, because the organization of the prayer, the form of the prayer, and the message of the prayer, those things were conceived in the very mind of Jesus. Can you imagine, 2,000 years later, you are praying a prayer that was conceived in the mind of God. When you fall on your knees and you lift up your voice in prayer, you are saying the words of Jesus. The Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is called the Lord's Prayer because the Lord himself commissioned us to pray this prayer. And so when you pray the prayer, you are being obedient to a command of Jesus. That's why it is called the Lord's Prayer. But I can share with you at least seven reasons why it is the people's prayer. Reason number one. Because just moments before Jesus gave this prayer, he had just finished praying his own prayer. For the Bible says in Luke, the 11th chapter and verse 1, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased. So the Lord had prayed his prayer already to the Father. And then he introduced this prayer, which I would propose to be called the people's prayer. That's the first reason why it's should be called the people's prayer. Jesus prayed his prayer already. And then, second reason, the request for the prayer was made by one of his own disciples. Jesus did not call his disciples together and say, I want to teach you a prayer. No, he did not. One of his disciples came and approached him and made a request of him and beseeched him. That's why it is called the people's prayer. Third reason, the request was made by one disciple on behalf of the group. He said in Luke 11 verse 1, Lord, not teach me to pray, but teach whom? Us to pray. It would have been justified for the disciples to say, Lord, teach me to pray. But something happens when we belong to the family of God. We do not think about and for ourselves alone. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. When we open the door, we don't open the door for just me and my wife. We open the door for the person coming after. Amen. God has called us to be a family. Not just to think about me and myself, but to think about us. He said, Lord, teach us to pray. I can hear somebody saying, why are you saying, Lord, teach us to pray? I don't want to learn to pray. Hmm? Isn't that the age in which we live in? I don't want to wear a mask. Come on, somebody say amen. If you want to wear it, you go right ahead. I want to enjoy my freedom. But here the disciple comes and he approaches Jesus and he makes a request not only on behalf of himself, but on behalf of the whole world. Teach the world to pray. Teach the church to pray. Teach mothers to pray. Teach fathers to pray. And I'm glad that Jesus did not turn that request down. Beloved, I'm here to tell you that something good happens 
when we speak up for other people. Amen, somebody. Reason number four, the request to be the people, people's prayer. It came about as a result of the example set by another. Notice in Luke 11 verse 1, Lord teach us to pray as John, did you hear that? As John also taught his disciples to pray. You see, John the Baptist was a believer in Jesus. But he had a different ministry. That's why, beloved, I'm here this morning to let you know that we ought not to look down on people who may have a different ministry from what you are doing. Amen, somebody? There are some believers who will never read another book from another Christian because they may not be a Seventh-day Adventist. That's not right. The disciple says, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. It is the same spirit who motivates you who will also motivate another Christian. I see somebody looking at me cross-eyed. What you talking about, Pastor? He's a Baptist. I don't want to read anything from a Baptist. I don't want to read anything from a Catholic. I don't want to read anything from a Presbyterian. It is God who inspires. And God can inspire a willing heart. Amen, somebody. Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. There are people out there doing wonderful things that are worth copying. Amen? I don't know if it was a Christian who made the mask, but I'm happy somebody made it. Come on, somebody say amen. I don't know who made the piano, but I'm glad somebody designed the piano. Amen. I don't know who made this suit. He perhaps was not a Christian, but I'm sure glad he made it. We ought to affirm the good that others do. Amen, somebody. Reason number five, Jesus gave this prayer. In answer to the request, and he said unto them, in response to the request, when you pray, this is what I want you to say. Like a mother teaching her child, Jesus made it so simple. Even the child can repeat the words of Jesus. When you can't pray, just say this prayer. When you're too tired to pray, just say this prayer. You don't have to go to school to earn degrees to say this prayer. You, you may be too tired, but when you're laying down and you are exhausted and you don't know what to say, just say this prayer. Jesus was saying, here is a formula to whisper into the very ears of God. Do you know you can whisper into God's ears? Jesus gave this prayer. God himself. Do you think that when we pray this prayer, that God would stop up his ears? No. Here is a prayer that my son gave to his people to pray. I want to hear that prayer. Here is the formula to whisper into the ears of God. Here is the password to enter into the divine presence. You know, when I get on my computer, if I don't type in the password, it's going to keep me out. Am I right? I've got my phone here. When I pull my phone out, and if I type in the wrong password, I won't even be able to make a call. And Jesus is saying to the believers in him that when you want to talk to my father, here is a password. Come on, somebody say amen. Here is the pin number to access the throne room of the universe. How many of you have online accounts? Wells Fargo Chase. 
If you want to access your money, you better know the pin. Come on, somebody say amen. You can't just type any pin. You've got to put in the pin number. Jesus gave us the formula, the password, the pin number to access the throne of God. And here is reason number six why it is called the people's prayer. There are, there are no first person singular pronouns in this prayer. There is no I in this prayer. Come on, somebody say amen. Did you realize that? There's not one me in this prayer. You know, sometimes I hear people pray, Lord, bless me. Give me this and give me that. Remember me. Not in this prayer. Because the request of the disciple was, Lord, teach us to pray. There is no I. There is no me. There is no my. There is no mine. There is no myself in this prayer prayer at all what do we find in this prayer we find per first person plural pronouns inclusive our father come on somebody say amen whether you're black or white red or yellow our father we are family. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. And how can members of one family hate other members of the same family? Come on, somebody say amen. amen. There is one father who is the father of every single one of us. And he was so great that he made us in different variety of colors. Come on, somebody say amen. Look at the flowers on the stage. You got some red flowers. You got some yellow flowers. They are flowers all the same. Our Father, give us, first person plural, our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver who? Deliver who? Every single one of us deliver us from what? From evil. And that's why this is not so much the Lord's Prayer. It is a prayer that America needs to pray during this election season. America is not for me and mine. America is for Kind of quiet out there. Us! Let me hear you say us. This is a dead crowd, Elder. <laughs> I'm just picking on you. Yes. The seventh reason and the last reason that this is the people's prayer, the elements in the prayer pertain to the necessities of people and not the necessities of God. Did you hear me? The necessities in this prayer pertain to the necessities of people and not the necessities of God. What are some necessities in this prayer? Our Father which art in heaven, people need to acknowledge God as their Father. We need to do that. If we all acknowledge God as Father, then we all acknowledge ourselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. It is impossible to treat another person as less than if you realize that we are brothers and sisters. Amen, somebody. Amen. Thy kingdom come is another necessity. People desire to live in their father's good kingdom. Amen. I want to get out of here, brothers and sisters. I'm tired of hot summers. I'm tired of cold winters. Come on, somebody say amen. I'm tired of rain and hurricane and earthquake. I want to get to my Father's good kingdom. And Jesus says that when you pray, say, thy kingdom, what? That's not a necessity of God. 
God is in his kingdom. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Thy will be done. People need order. Thy will be done. I want to live in a world where there is kingdom order. That when I'm stopped by the police, I'll be treated with respect. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Can I talk this morning, folks? Now, I pray not to be stopped. Amen. And so I'm driving right on the speed limit. Amen. Because Christians ought to obey the law. Amen. Somebody was speeding to church this morning. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God has a will. God has order. And we need to live in a kingdom. We need to live in a society that's orderly, not for some, but for all. Give us our daily bread. God doesn't need bread. Am I right? God does not need bread. We need bread. Give us our daily bread. We do not only need bread today, we need bread tomorrow too. Amen? Amen. I wish I had time to break this down. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We need to be forgiven. God does not need to be forgiven for anything. Lead us not into temptation. God cannot be tempted. Amen? He's in control. And deliver us from evil. God can deliver himself from evil. Amen? This is the people's prayer. So I'm here to tell you this morning, saints of God, that this prayer was designed by the maker of people for people. Trials and troubles may come in our world, but the people need to pray. Pain and problems in the nation, we need to pray. Death and destruction, catastrophes and calamities, we need to pray. Headache and heartache, we need to do what? Pray. And some people go out there and they break windows and light fires. Doesn't solve anything. We need to pray. So the first point from this story, and I'm, I'm not going to keep you long. I'm going to leave you, let you out of here in eight minutes. It's called the people's prayer. Secondly, this prayer is patterned after the Ten Commandments to underscore its significance and necessity. The Ten Commandments were given by God in the Spirit. And Moses went up to receive it. The people's prayer was given by God in the flesh. And Jesus came down to give it. Come on, somebody say amen. The Ten Commandments contains ten precepts divided on two tables of stone. The, 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 the prayer, people's prayer uh, contains seven petitions divided for the two tables of the mind. You know your mind, you've got two sections of your mind. Did you know that? The first table of the Ten Commandments presents four duties to God. Have no other gods before you. Do not make any graven images. Don't take God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What about the Lord's Prayer? We find the first three pertain to God. Let your name be hallowed. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you see it? The second table of the commandments pertain to our duties to each other. Honor your parents. And I've been told, it doesn't matter how old, your, how old you get, your parents are still your parents. Amen? Amen? Thank you, brother, for interceding, talking about your parents. Whether they can raise a hand to slap you or not, they're still your mama and your papa. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Honor your mother and the father. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. 
these last six of the Ten Commandments pertain to our duties to each other. The second table of the, of the people's prayer also pertain to our responsibilities uh, from God to us. Give us our bread. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. The second part pertain to us. What if we choose not to live in alignment with the Ten Commandments? It's just pure chaos. Am I right? We shoot and kill, we steal, we lie, we take somebody's wife, hmm? we take their property. So if we do not live in, in conjunction, in alignment with the Ten Commandments, there is chaos. Well, what if we choose not to live in alignment with the people's prayer? Then there's also chaos. Five young college students decided to spend a Sunday in London. They decided they want to go hear the great preacher at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, Charles Spurgeon. While in the line outside, a kind gentleman approached them and asked them a question, a strange question. Young man, would you like to see the heating plant of this church? Now, mind you, it's summer in London. Who wants to see a heating plant in summer? Not me. They decided to follow the stranger. So they walked down a stairway into a large room, and then the gentleman whispered, there is the heating plant. When they looked through the door, they saw 700 people with heads bowed in prayer before God. The pastor gently closed the door. It was none other than Charles Purgeon himself. Beloved, I stop by here to tell you that the plant of the Rome church has got to be prayer. Come on, somebody say amen. The heating plant is prayer. The cooling plant in winter is prayer. The power plant, the water plant, the preaching plant, the ministry plant, the visitation plant of this church must be based on prayer. Amen. For the Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man and the righteous woman can bring down kingdoms. Come on, somebody say amen. I wish I had time this morning. Got about three minutes left, Pastor. I heard one singer saying, now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry and he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer wheel turning, then you know a little fire is burning. Then you will have a little talk with Jesus and he will make it right all right. Got two minutes left. Mm. Third lesson, this prayer fulfills God's will for all the people of the world. Do you know that it is God's will for all the people of the world to eat every day? Do you know that? Well, that's what it says. Give us this day our daily bread. We, have a, we need deliverance <clears throat> from food hunger. We need deliverance from love hunger. There are people in our communities who are desperate and they're looking for love and they do destructive things. We need deliverance from justice hunger. In our society today, people are crying out for justice. Give us this day our daily bread. Not only of food and love, but also justice. I've got one minute left. <laughs> Uh, 
Let me, let me go to the last point. And I like this last point. I want to close on this. This prayer announces the reason <clears throat> we need to hang in there. We need a reason to hang in there nowadays, don't we? Mental health challenges are the challenges of our time. <clears throat> People are literally going crazy. Well, here it is. <clears throat> the prayer ends with this. Three great reasons to hang in there. For thine is the what? <clears throat> kingdom <clears throat> you see beloved i came by here to tell you that in the end there will only be one what one kingdom the prophet declared in daniel the second chapter verse 34 that one day a stone will be cut out without hands and shatter the kingdoms of this world the kingdom of gold babylon is no more one day there will be one kingdom. The kingdom of silver, Media Persia, is no more. One day there shall be only one kingdom. The kingdom of brass, Greece, is no more. One day there will only be one kingdom. <clears throat> the kingdom of iron, Rome, is no more. One day there will be only one kingdom. The kingdom of iron and clay, the European Union, will be no more. There will only be one kingdom. One day, the eagle kingdom that is the United States will be no more. How many of you believe that? One day, the lion kingdom, Great Britain, will be no more. The dragon kingdom, China, will be no more. The bear kingdom, Russia, will be no more. Daniel says that the wind came and he carried the kingdoms away. But in place of those kingdoms, the Bible says that a stone that was cut out without hands, come on, somebody say amen, filled the earth with the kingdom of God. For thine is the kingdom. I want to pray that God's kingdom comes soon enough. Secondly, for thine is the power. One day there will only be one power in the universe. power over people one day only God's power will be over people power over pastors and professors and politicians and presidents one day God himself will be the power over those who hold the power power over problems come out here somebody else say amen problem the power over pain power over pandemics Power over plagues, power over sickness, power over disease, power over accidents, and power over death. I get excited when I preach, amen? Now you, now you know better to invite me next time, huh? One day there will only be one power. Those who govern will have no power. Those who walk in the hospitals with the stethoscope around their necks, declaring that they have power over those who are sick, one day the great physician will be the only power. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and thine is the what? Praise. Somebody ought to be shouting just about now. There will be one recipient of the glory, and it will be God himself. The Bible says that God's glory will cover the world as the water covers the sea. I've got to be there to see it. Amen. The glory of the kings of the earth, God will take back. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. The glory of the president, God will take back. The glory of princes, God will take back. The glory of prime ministers, the glory of empire, emperors, the glory of those who lead, God will take back himself. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. 
the glory of all the kingdoms of the world. You remember the devil came to Jesus and said, I will give you the glory of the kingdoms if you worship me. How dare you? The glory of all the powers of the world. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Now here's a question. This is the the test question. If you pass this question, you pass the test. Here's the question. How long will God retain the kingdom and the power and the glory? Ah, you pass. Amen, somebody. Forever and ever. Let me hear you say it. And how long? And ever and ever there will be no election for the kingdom and the power and the glory. Come on, somebody say amen. If you long to see that day, let me see you raise your hand. I can't wait. I can't wait for us to be one happy family. I've often heard some people say, well, when we get to heaven, we're going to go over to the side where the Hispanics are. No such thing. We'll go to the side where the, where the Africans are and the Caucasians are. No such thing, for thine is a kingdom. One kingdom, one people. For all eternity. You sleep and wake up. And he's still ruling. Come on, somebody. Let's pray, Father. We rejoice this morning at the beauty of his prayer. That you ask us to pray. And Lord, we're going to pray this prayer this week. In fact, we're going to pray it right now. May this prayer bring power into our lives. To see beyond our own selves. To see others. And to in acknowledge that we have one shared destiny. And so we pray together, our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into, but deliver us from. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. For how long? For how long? For how long? And let God's people say, Amen.